Hello and welcome to another one of my nagging thoughts. I wanted to talk today about this sermon, The Ultimate Meaning of True Womanhood. And I'm going to include a link to this sermon in the description of this video so that you can check it out for yourself. And I very much um, enjoy hearing what your thoughts are, be it on the sermon or on anything that I have to say in this video. So on that note, please do like, subscribe, share, and comment so that we can get as many people involved in this conversation as possible. With that said, uh, let me go ahead and share with you some of my thoughts on this sermon. It's a 45-minute sermon, and I want to try to keep my nagging thoughts to around 10 minutes, so I'm not going to have time to get to all of them this episode. Um, but here we go. I want to start off on a positive note and say that um, really enjoyed his uh, very beautiful God honoring prayer at the beginning of this sermon. And I want to commend him for the courage that is required to share what his understanding of biblical womanhood is to an audience of 6,000 women. Now, that being said, I do want to address some of the statements that he made that uh, rub me the wrong way. Um, the first is that he thanked the audience for the opportunity to address, quote, the most influential people in the world. Right away, that felt like pandering to me because a statement like that is really affirming the preeminent value of power, authority, dominion, and influence. And Given the complementarian construct, that doesn't really make sense to uh, validate that as a preeminent value to me. And secondly, as a Christian, I'm not even sure that's something men should be uh, chasing after. Uh, the, the Bible says that God is in the process of putting every dominion and uh, power and authority under his feet and that in the end, it says in Revelation that he will do away with all uh, authority. So um, those are my thoughts on that first statement. Um, along the same lines, he made these statements. I distinguish... I distinguish from authority and influence. A woman on her knees sways more in this nation than a thousand three-piece suited Wall Street jerks. So, uh, okay, the distinguishing from authority and influence. If prayer is what gives you influence, then certainly a praying person with authority should have more influence and fit the most influential people in the world category. And uh, because both men and women are able to pray, um, that should make all believers the most influential people in the world. So therefore, simply being a believing woman does not categorically make you one of the most influential people in the world, even by this definition. Now, that being said, what the concept I think he's appealing to, the biblical concept I think he's appealing to, is really James 5.16 that says that the prayer of a righteous person has great effectiveness. But if you read the two verses before this, you're going to see that the context really is talking about church elders. So authority is not completely irrelevant to the discussion here. But moving on to the next uh, concept here, he made this statement in the beginning of the video. He said, the aim of this message is to clar clarify as best as I can from the scriptures, the ultimate meaning of true womanhood. Fantastic. Sounds great. Problem is that the next 10 minutes or so of the sermon, he went through examples that were not from the Bible to demonstrate what he considers to be women that are not wimpy. Uh, one of the most irksome statements he made in this section of the sermon, he said, wimpy theology makes wimpy women. I don't like wimpy women. I didn't marry one. Um, I'm assuming that he's making a statement like this to establish credibility with the audience to let us know that his intent really is not to dominate or crush women into submission um, and uh, being wallflowers and, and yes women. Um, but because it's grounded in his personal preference, it has no authority. I just, it doesn't mean anything to me. As a believer, I really don't care if you have a preference for wimpy women, and I don't care if you married one. What I care about is what 
God wants and what God likes and what God expects me as a woman to be married to doctrinally. Um, so I just uh, wanted to um, say that. Now, he does, does define what he considers to be wimpy theology. He says that it is theology where God is not good or big enough to enable women to magnify God all the time because it's essentially human centric instead of god centric. Now I would agree with that and th this is a problem in many areas of um theology not just that related to marriage and men and women, but I would call it self-serving or self-deceit. <laughs> I wouldn't call it uh, wimpy, but that's really neither here nor there. He defines in contrast what he calls steel theology, where he says the ultimate purpose of the universe is to display the glory of Christ in its highest expression in his dying to make a rebellious people his bride. I would agree with that. Um, although I think on the other side of eternity, it's uh, not the marriage. It, it's not the wedding. It's, it's the marriage. It's the union. It's the one fleshness with God. Um, that is the highest expression, um, but it is remarkable what Christ did to redeem us uh, for no reason at all that we merited because we're all uh, rebels by nature. Um, and when he's making these points, he does back it up with scripture. He provides three and he sums all of those up with this idea that the um, the purpose of the universe is to um, bring glory to God's grace that purchased and purified his wife out of a hell-bent people. Um, focusing it in on the wedding instead of the marriage, um, what this is doing for me is it's categorically, functionally deifying manhood and categorically, functionally relegating womanhood to sin and hell bentness. And I think that those assumptions cause a lot of problems um, because when that is your understanding, um, if a woman does speak up um, and complains, you're not going to listen because she's hell bent. And when a man speaks up and complains, you're going to listen because he is like God and is to be revered in marriage. Um, moving on to um, another statement he made. He said, you can transform every simple diaper moment or any other moment into massive significance if you realize that your womanhood is here being brought to the very center of the purposes of God in this universe, which come to a climax when Christ the husband bought his bride. Now, uh, I do want to say that uh, diaper moments um, are uh, moments of motherhood, not of womanhood. But um, he does say any other moment. So again, I think what the concept he's going for here is that um, even though we're not celebrated with honor and power and authority uh, and uh, when we speak, people listen, um, he's saying that no matter what you do, it does have purpose um, because you're, you're, you're serving your God. Um, and he's tying it again to the wedding uh, of Christ and his church. Um, I would personally, um, as a woman, tie it more to Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 through 25. And this is what it says. Whatever you are doing, work at it with enthusiasm as to the Lord and not for people. Because you know that you will receive your inheritance from the Lord as a reward. Serve the Lord Christ for the one who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong and there are no exceptions. So um, I just want to say in my failing marriage, um, especially in our last round of uh, Christian marriage counseling, my husband's behavior felt to me like he was taking my heart out of my chest and slamming it on the ground. And the uh, marriage theology uh, that came in alongside of him in the counseling felt like a monster truck that the three of them were in the cabin running donuts over my heart that was exposed and on the ground. Now, this isn't to say that I'm without sin and that I haven't hurt my husband and um, he may have endured similar um, experiences in marriage for which I am sorry and I regret. I don't want to make people um, hurt because of my sin. 
So I don't want to say that because I suffer that this somehow exonerates me. What I want to say is how I was able to endure that, given the fact that I'm a sinner, uh, was not by gripping to this idea that I am a representation on a micro level of the church and my husband is a micro representation of God himself. Um, what I was able to endure that is by these ideas that are in Colossians 3 here is that I knew that I could trust God. <laughs> I didn't know that I could trust anything else, but I knew that eventually that especially if I suffered and this was an opportunity for me to exercise my faith if, uh, uh, that God would repay. And just because I was being harmed and things were not being done right to me did not give me license to return evil for evil because there are no exceptions. Everyone will be repaid for what they do. So um, I've already gone over the amount of time that I would like to spend um, on this particular video. And I have a lot more um, more biblical uh, stuff that I would really like to get to. So I really hope that you stay tuned for my next nagging thought where we can make it through uh, when he gets into the topic of marriage and singleness as it pertains to womanhood. So I hope you have a great week. Thank you very much for your time and I'll see you next nagging thought.